The man known to history as Lord Halifax was born Edward Wood on the 16th of April, 1881, at Powderham Castle in the county of Devon in England. Edward's father, Charles Lindley Wood, was born in 1839 and succeeded to the title of second Viscount upon the death of the first Viscount in 1885. The second Viscount is best known for being a champion of High Anglicanism, a sect within the Church of England which was almost indistinguishable from Catholicism in regard to its beliefs and rituals. From 1868, he served as the president of the English Church Union, a movement which promoted Catholicism in Britain and aimed for the reunification of the Church of England and the Roman Catholic Church. His religious beliefs were combined with an interest in mysticism and spirituality, which led him to collect and publish a popular collection of ghost stories. Edward's mother, Lady Agnes Elizabeth Courtney, was born in 1838, the daughter of William Courtney, the 11th Earl of Devon, a conservative politician who occupied a couple of minor government posts in the late 1860s. Lady Agnes married her husband in April 1869 and had six children, four sons and two daughters, of whom Edward was the youngest. She proved a loving and kind mother to her son, providing him with a sense of stability and security in his childhood, traits that were lacking in his father's makeup. Edward's family was part of the British aristocracy, but for centuries the Wood family had been merchants in York. They joined the social and economic elite after the discovery of coal on their land at the end of the 18th century. In 1829, Edward's paternal grandfather, who was also named Charles, married the daughter of Whig Prime Minister Earl Grey. The elder Charles Wood became a prominent politician in his own right, serving as Chancellor of the Exchequer and Secretary of State for India for Liberal governments in the mid-19th century, before being elevated to the House of Lords as First Viscount Halifax in 1866. Born without a left hand, Edward also had a shortened left arm, but this disability would not prove an impediment to his later success, and he was accustomed to using a false hand. Although he was born in his maternal grandfather's castle in Devon, he spent his childhood at his father's estates of Hickleton Hall and Garraby in Yorkshire. A series of tragedies and bereavements during his childhood would have a great impact on Edward's character and destiny. Between 1886 and 1890, his three elder brothers all died from illnesses which frequently affected children of the Victorian era. Although he was the youngest child, this not only left Edward as the heir to his father's estates and titles, but also as the sole target of his father's love and lofty aspirations for his offspring. After being sent to prep school at the age of 11, he would often receive letters from his father expressing the hope that you may turn out the pride and happiness of our life. We have all had so much sorrow in the past that now everything seems to center on you. In 1894, Edward went to Eton College, the most prestigious of Britain's public schools and the breeding ground for the country's political and social elite. His academic performance was not spectacular and he preferred to spend his time playing tennis and cycling. After five years at Eton, he went to study history at Christchurch College, one of the wealthiest of the Oxford colleges. While indulging in all the social pursuits expected of an aristocratic Oxford undergraduate, as demonstrated by his membership of the heavy-drinking and hard-partying Bullingdon Club, he was also capable of studying hard and graduated with first-class honors, which won him a fellowship at All Souls College. His proud father wrote to him, I am quite determined that you are to be Prime Minister and reunite England to the Holy See. In other words, to reunite the Anglican and Catholic churches. Wood was a wealthy man upon his return from Oxford after inheriting houses in London and Yorkshire from childless aunts and uncles, and he had also been given Garraby by his father. Like many wealthy young aristocrats in the early 20s, in 1904, Wood decided to go on a grand tour. But while most British aristocrats went to Europe to see the artistic and cultural heritage of centuries past, his tour would be of the British Empire, stopping off at South Africa, India, Ceylon, Australia, and New Zealand. And a few years later, in 1907, he would also visit Canada. Although he was expected to embark on a political career, 
he decided that the time was not right to do so. He was a political conservative at a time when the Conservative Party was defeated in a landslide by Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman's Liberals in 1906. Wood, therefore, went back to Oxford to take up his fellowship at All Souls, writing a biography of the clergyman John Keeble, one of the leaders of the Oxford movement which inspired the Second Viscount's high Anglicanism. By the time the biography was published in 1909, Wood felt confident enough to run as a candidate in the 1910 general election for the Conservative or Tory party. As a young and aspiring Conservative politician, Wood was expected to have a wife, and on the 21st of September 1909, he married Lady Dorothy Onslow, the daughter of the fourth Earl of Onslow, who served as Governor of New Zealand between 1889 and 1892. Lady Dorothy's sociability and wisdom enabled her to be an effective supporter of her husband's political career. In addition to playing the role of a political wife at social gatherings, she was a diligent manager of her husband's estates. When the general election of January 1910 was called and Wood was chosen as the Conservative candidate for Ripon in Yorkshire, the couple cut short their honeymoon in order to campaign. The efforts paid off as Wood was elected to the House of Commons with a majority of 1,000, defeating the incumbent Liberal Member of Parliament in the process. In a second general election that year, held in December, Wood retained his seat with a slightly more narrow majority, but his hold on the seat was deemed so secure that he would be elected unopposed for the rest of his career in the Commons. The Honourable Edward Wood was intelligent, reserved and pragmatic, attributes which were in short supply when he entered the House of Commons. Over the course of the 19th century, political power in Britain continued its gradual shift from the landed aristocracy in the House of Lords towards the commercial and popular interests in the House of Commons. The Liberal governments under Campbell Bannerman and Herbert Asquith embarked on a series of reforms which increased state support for the sick and elderly and laid the foundations for the welfare state. After the House of Lords broke convention by voting against Chancellor David Lloyd George's People's Budget in 1909, the Liberal government passed legislation to limit the power of the House of Lords by removing its right to veto money bills and limiting its veto power over other legislation to two years. In addition to the struggle between the two Houses of Parliament, British governments since the late 19th century were struggling to resist Irish demands for home rule a form of autonomy within the British Empire. With the dawn of the 20th century, the British Empire's status as the most powerful state in the world was under threat from a German empire that emerged from the wars of unification in the 1860s and 70s and was expanding its naval capabilities under Kaiser Wilhelm II. Sitting on the opposition benches in the House of Commons, Edward Wood said little about these major developments in domestic and foreign affairs limiting himself to interventions on minor issues. He seemed more interested in devoting his time to his family after his wife gave birth to daughter Anne in 1910 and son Charles in 1912. Following the outbreak of the First World War with Germany on the 4th of August 1914, Wood and most of his Conservative colleagues enthusiastically supported the war in Parliament despite being part of the opposition. In spite of his disability, he obtained a commission in the Queen's own Yorkshire Dragoons, spending three years in Flanders, carrying out duties including capturing deserters, repairing roads and burying the dead. When he was back in England on leave from the army, Wood would use the opportunity to make speeches in Parliament, urging the government to prosecute the war more vigorously, even if it meant inviting the left-wing Labour Party into government. In May 1915, the Conservatives were brought into Asquith's wartime government, but the Prime Minister's weaknesses as a war leader forced him to step down in favour of David Lloyd George in December 1916. In September 1917, Wood became Deputy Director of Labour Supply in the Ministry of National Service and remained in the post until the end of 1918. At the end of the war in November 1918, Wood supported a harsh peace with Germany in order to punish the German authorities for starting the war. Lloyd George went into the general election of 1918, maintaining his wartime coalition, and split the Liberal Party in the process. As a result, the Conservatives won 379 seats, 
and though Lloyd George continued as Prime Minister, his coalition Liberals returned only 127 MPs. Previously, Wood suffered from there being too few Conservative MPs, but now there were too many, and in order to get himself noticed by party superiors, he joined a group of around a dozen like-minded Tory MPs who supported some Liberal causes, such as equal voting rights for women and subsidised housing for the poor. Wood's reputation as an intellectual among the Tory MPs was strengthened by a political manifesto he co-authored in 1918 with Sir George Lloyd under the title The Great Opportunity, which called for greater devolution of power from the central government in Westminster and a more cooperative approach to the trade unions. In 1921, he was made a junior minister as undersecretary at the colonial office at a time when Winston Churchill, at the time a Liberal MP, served as Secretary of State and was his direct superior. Wood regarded Churchill as a fascinating but unpredictable character, who was difficult to work with, while Churchill saw his junior minister as dependable but unwilling to be persuaded. In the months before the 1922 election, Wood was one of many junior ministers in the coalition government who were unhappy about Lloyd George. They were appalled by the Prime Minister's decision to make peace in the War of Irish Independence when the British government effectively recognised the independence of 26 of the 32 counties in Ireland. On the 17th of October 1922, Wood and a couple of his colleagues wrote to party leader Austin Chamberlain, calling for a break from Lloyd George. Chamberlain supported the coalition and called a meeting of all Conservative MPs on the 19th to vote on the matter and more than two-thirds voted against the coalition. Lloyd George resigned as Prime Minister and was replaced by Andrew Bonner Law, the former Tory leader who backed the anti-coalition rebels. Wood was rewarded for his part in the revolt by being appointed President of the Board of Education. Although this was a cabinet post, his duties were relatively light and his budget limited, allowing him to go hunting twice a week. In May 1923, Bonner Law resigned due to illness and was succeeded by Stanley Baldwin, who lost power after calling an election in December. The Labour Party, under Ramsay MacDonald, came to office for the first time, but struggled to lead a minority administration, and Baldwin returned to office in October 1924. Wood was appointed Minister for Agriculture, but did not leave much of a mark in this role. In October 1925, on the advice of King George V, Baldwin offered Wood the post of Viceroy of India, a role which deputised for the King Emperor and the Prime Minister in the subcontinent with a population of 320 million people. Owing to the age of his 87-year-old father, Wood was initially reluctant to accept the post. But after being raised to the House of Lords as Baron Irwin of Kirby Underdale in Yorkshire, he and Lady Dorothy left for India in March 1926. Given he only had three years of ministerial experience and no political achievements to his name, Lord Irwin's appointment came as a surprise. Thanks in part to the educational reforms introduced during his grandfather's tenure as Secretary of State for India more than half a century earlier, the Indian middle class was developing a sense of national consciousness and began to call for independence. Although Irwin believed that the British Empire was a force for good in India and other colonies around the world, he recognised that Indian self-government was inevitable, sooner or later, and believed that the British government should aim to manage the process peacefully, a position which put him at odds with Lord Birkenhead, his superior as Secretary of State for India. The Indian independence movement was weak and divided with Mahatma Gandhi's Congress Party being largely a middle-class movement, while the Muslim League, under Muhammad Ali Jinnah, wanted a weak central government in Delhi to ensure the autonomy of the Muslim-majority provinces in the northwest and northeast. In September 1927, Irwin and Birkenhead established a parliamentary commission to make further recommendations for self-government. Prompted by fears that appointing Indians to the commission would result in clashes between Hindu and Muslim representatives and antagonize the Indian leaders who were not invited, they appointed an all-white commission led by the Liberal MP Sir John Simon. 
The prospect of the British deciding on the political future of India without Indian representation prompted a boycott from the Indian political classes. The independence leader, Motilal Nehru, presented a report which called for dominion status for India, placing it on the same level as the white colonies in the empire. In December 1928, Congress announced that should the government of India not support Nehru's report within a year, it would resurrect its campaign of non-cooperation to resist British rule through non-violent means, such as the boycott of British goods and non-payment of tax, which had been attempted and abandoned in the early 1920s. After losing faith in the Simon Commission's unimaginative recommendations, Irwin was determined to present his own solution, which was to make a declaration offering India dominion status at an undetermined date and to invite Indian politicians to a conference in London to discuss the terms. Irwin returned to England in the summer of 1929 to sell his plan to the British political establishment. After Baldwin lost power to Macdonald in June 1929, the new Labour Secretary of State, William Wedgwood Benn, was supportive of Irwin's plan, while Baldwin was happy to go along with it if Simon agreed. When Simon and the members of his commission rejected Irwin's declaration, Baldwin came under fierce attack from the right wing of his party, and his shadow cabinet urged him to persuade his protégé to drop the plan. However, Irwin returned to India in October, determined to see his declaration through, persuading the Indian moderates of its merits. Defying Baldwin's calls to hold fire, Irwin went ahead, and by the time the House of Commons debated the question on the 7th of November, Baldwin was supported by a majority of his MPs and remained leader. On the 23rd of December, having survived a botched attempt by Hindu terrorists to blow up his train in the morning, Irwin met with Indian political leaders in New Delhi to discuss the plans for a roundtable conference in London. He was unable to persuade them that his declaration was not a political ploy to win time, and the meeting broke up without any agreement. A week later, Congress voted to resume its civil disobedience campaign, calling for national demonstrations on the 26th of January 1930. Irwin responded by allowing the meetings to go ahead, but arresting the speakers afterwards on charges of sedition. In March, Gandhi decided to protest against the British government's monopoly on salt by walking for three weeks from Ahmedabad to the sea, where he would scoop up salt and break the law. Irwin considered this a silly and harmless stunt and left Gandhi at liberty while arresting several other prominent Congress leaders. But after the civil disobedience campaign turned violent in April with attacks on the British military presence in India, the Viceroy was forced to crack down and arrested Gandhi in early May, further inflaming the violence. With its most prominent leaders in prison, Congress boycotted the Roundtable Conference held in London, which met between November 1930 and January 1931, but failed to agree on anything substantive beyond an endorsement for self-government and federation. In an effort to salvage something constructive, at the end of the conference, Irwin struck a conciliatory tone and released the Congress leaders from prison. In February 1931, he met Gandhi for eight rounds of talks to discuss proposals to end the civil disobedience campaign. In return for the release of the 19,000 prisoners arrested and for the return of all their confiscated property, Gandhi agreed to call off the civil disobedience campaign and to attend the second round table conference. The Irwin Gandhi Pact concluded on the 4th of March and raised Gandhi's political profile in India and Britain. And although the pact was welcomed by the House of Commons for restoring peace to India, many die-hard defenders of empire and the Conservative Party resented the fact that Gandhi had been negotiating with the representative of the British Crown on equal terms. Their leader was Winston Churchill, who had returned to the Conservative benches in 1924 and served as Baldwin's Chancellor of the Exchequer between 1924 and 1929. He resigned from Baldwin's shadow cabinet in January, protesting against the Conservative leader's endorsement of Irwin's India policy. But Baldwin once again successfully weathered the storm. When Irwin returned to England on the 3rd of May, after the end of his five-year term, 
he was greeted as a hero. He was offered an earldom, but refused on the basis that he would outrank his 92-year-old father. Lord Irwin returned to a country in the midst of an economic and political crisis. With the world plunged into the Great Depression following the Wall Street crash of November 1929, MacDonald was forced to cut government spending, but by August 1931, his Labour MPs were unwilling to support any further cuts. When the government resigned as it was unable to pass its budget, MacDonald was persuaded by King George V to form a national government with the Conservatives and Liberals. The new government won an overwhelming majority in the election of October 1931, and the House of Commons was dominated by the 470 Conservative MPs. Upon his return from India, Irwin had established himself as one of the leading political figures in the country, but remained out of cabinet. Although he was reappointed to the Board of Education in June 1932, he continued to focus on the India question, both in Parliament and among his Conservative colleagues. Eventually, the Government of India Act was passed in 1935, increasing autonomy for the provinces of British India and allowing the princely states to be part of an Indian federation. In 1933, Irwin was elected Chancellor of Oxford University, and following the death of his father in January 1934, he became the third Viscount Halifax. His success in pacifying India encouraged him in the belief that political and diplomatic conflicts were best solved non-violently through negotiation. Adolf Hitler's Nazi party took power in Germany in 1933 and promised territorial expansion to incorporate the millions of ethnic Germans beyond Germany's borders. While Hitler's rhetoric proved a source of anxiety for Britain and France, Halifax thought that tensions could be diffused peacefully. He was far from alone in the belief that Hitler could be appeased, and by the early 1930s, most leading British politicians believed that Germany had been provoked into starting the First World War because it felt threatened by the alliance of France to its west and Russia to its east. Politicians of all stripes were horrified about the prospect of another world war and did all they could to maintain the peace. And Churchill was one of the few British politicians warning against the threat of Hitler's Nazi regime. When Baldwin became Prime Minister again in June 1935, after MacDonald stepped down due to ill health, Halifax was appointed Secretary of State for War, where he could be counted on to resist vote-losing calls for rearmament before the upcoming election in November. After Baldwin's national government won a landslide, Halifax was appointed Lord Privy Seal and leader of the House of Lords, but Baldwin's government was plunged into crisis weeks later. In October 1935, Benito Mussolini, the fascist leader of Italy, ordered the Italian invasion of Abyssinia, modern-day Ethiopia. While the British and French governments appealed to the ineffectual League of Nations to stop the invasion, Foreign Secretary Hoare and his French counterpart, Pierre Laval, offered to give Italy two-thirds of Abyssinia in return for the end of hostilities. The plans were leaked to the media and provoked a public outcry. And during a cabinet meeting on the 18th of December, Halifax led calls for the Foreign Secretary to resign. Baldwin appointed Anthony Eden to the Foreign Office and asked Halifax to be his unofficial deputy. When Hitler violated the post-war Treaty of Versailles, by marching his armies into the demilitarized Rhineland in 1936, Eden and Halifax refused to support French calls to resist the incursion. A compromise proposed by Halifax to establish a zone 20 miles either side of the Rhine, policed by an international force, was rejected by the Germans, who knew that the British were unwilling to go to war. Non-intervention was also in order after the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War in July 1936, and the leading European powers met in London and agreed to observe neutrality in the conflict. Only Britain and France kept the agreement, with Germany and Italy siding with Franco's nationalists, and the Soviet Union supporting the left-wing Republican government. After King George V died in January 1936, his son and successor, Edward VIII, was persuaded by the government 
to abdicate the throne at the end of the year due to the implications of his relationship with the American divorcee, Mrs. Wallace Simpson. Edward's younger brother, the Duke of York, became King George VI in December. Shortly after George VI's coronation, Baldwin retired on the 28th of May 1937 and was succeeded by his chancellor, Neville Chamberlain. Halifax was given the more prestigious honorary role of Lord President of the Council and continued as leader of the Lords and as Eden's deputy at the Foreign Office. Unlike Baldwin, who was uninterested in foreign policy, Chamberlain took a more active role in foreign affairs and hoped to improve relations with both Germany and Italy. As part of the initiative, Halifax met Hitler at his mountaintop retreat at Berchtesgaden on the 19th of November 1937, where he hinted to Hitler that parts of Versailles could be renegotiated. In return, he received reassurances about maintaining peace and observing international law that the German Führer had no intention of keeping. Enticed by the prospect of a general peace settlement in Europe, Halifax worked out a plan to give Germany greater influence in Africa, only to realize that Africa was rather low on Hitler's list of priorities. He was also prepared to weaken the powers of the League of Nations in order to readmit Germany to the organization, though Hitler did not care much for the League. Although Eden was not opposed to Halifax's meeting with Hitler, he expressed concern about Chamberlain's efforts to negotiate with Italy and resigned as Foreign Secretary on the 20th of February 1938. Halifax succeeded Eden in the Foreign Office, where he soon found his foreign policy unravelling. Rather than being appeased, Hitler continued to criticise the British and threatened war if Germany was not allowed to expand. On the 12th of March, German forces marched into Austria and on the following day, the country was forcibly annexed to Germany in violation of Versailles. Britain was in no position to respond to Austrian pleas for assistance, and Halifax began to wonder if Hitler could ever be appeased. Following the annexation of Austria, Germany now surrounded Czechoslovakia on three sides and seemed poised to continue its aggression. As part of its efforts to incorporate ethnic Germans into his expanding state, Hitler turned his attention to the Sudetenland, the name given to the German-speaking territories around Czechoslovakia's northern, western and southern border. In the years after the First World War, the French government pursued a policy of strengthening diplomatic and military ties to Central and Eastern European nations such as Poland, Czechoslovakia and Romania in order to deter German aggression. If France were to go to war against Germany over Central Europe, Britain would have to follow suit. After examining the question with his cabinet colleagues, Halifax decided that the British and French would be unable to prevent Czechoslovakia from being overrun in the event of war, and therefore there was no point in risking a general European conflict. In private, the Foreign Secretary tried to persuade France not to go to war, while in public, the British government warned the Germans that military intervention remained on the table in the event of hostilities in Czechoslovakia. On the 13th of September, the Czechoslovak government in Prague declared martial law, anticipating a German invasion of the Sudetenland. A couple of days later, the Sudeten Nazi leader, Konrad Henlein, fled to Germany and appealed to Hitler for protection. Anticipating the outbreak of hostilities over the Sudetenland, Chamberlain flew to Germany to meet Hitler in person at his Bavarian mountaintop retreat of Berchtesgaden. Chamberlain and Halifax were not opposed to the principle that the Sudeten Germans should be part of Germany, and both men believed that a strong Germany would serve as an effective bulwark against the communist Soviet Union further east. At Berchtesgaden, the Prime Minister agreed to the principle of allowing the Sudeten Germans to decide their own fate by holding a plebiscite and returned to England convinced that Hitler was a man with whom I can do business. The British and French followed up by sending the Czechoslovak president, Edvard Benec, an instruction to surrender territories where German speakers made up more than 50% of the population. When Chamberlain met Hitler on the 22nd of September at Bad Gottesberg to present the Anglo-French proposals, the Führer rejected them 
and demanded a larger piece of territory to be handed over immediately. Hitler's blackmail signaled to Halifax that he could not be trusted and was not open to compromise, and the foreign secretary began to distance himself from appeasement. While Chamberlain was prepared to accept Hitler's demands, Halifax told the Prime Minister at Cabinet on the 25th that he was unwilling to put further pressure on Benich, even if it risked war. Chamberlain was shocked by Halifax's about turn and threatened to resign if Britain were to go to war over Czechoslovakia. When senior government ministers were invited to give their views, the cabinet was almost evenly split between the prime minister and foreign secretary. Chamberlain gave in and agreed to send a message to Czechoslovakia providing an objective analysis of the situation, but without pressuring Benich to give in. However, on the evening of the 27th of September, Chamberlain and senior Foreign Office officials tried to pressure Halifax into sending a telegram to Prague, which effectively called for the withdrawal of troops up to the lines Hitler had drawn at Bad Gottesberg. The Prime Minister made a broadcast in which he infamously described the Sudeten crisis as a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing, a deeply ironic remark given the extent of the British Empire at the time. In the face of Halifax's opposition, the telegram was not sent, and Hitler appeared to back down. The Führer then invited Chamberlain, Prime Minister de Ladier of France, and Italy's Mussolini to a conference in Munich on the 29th of September. At the time, the Munich Agreement was considered a triumph for Anglo-French diplomacy, since Hitler had backed down from his Gottesberg proposals and agreed that the transfer of the Sudetenland would take place under international jurisdiction. At the end of the conference, Chamberlain asked Hitler to sign a document making the commitment that the British and German peoples would never fight each other again, which the Prime Minister waved in the air upon returning to England, declaring he had made peace for our time. Despite the demonstration of enthusiasm and relief that accompanied Chamberlain upon his return to London, Halifax warned the Prime Minister that the success might be short-lived. While Chamberlain's speech in the House of Commons suggested that the deal with Hitler could pave the way for general European disarmament, in the House of Lords, Halifax described the Munich Agreement as the better of a hideous choice of evils. Despite being increasingly at odds with his Prime Minister, Halifax believed that resigning would be an abdication of responsibility and decided to fight against appeasement from within the cabinet where he urged Chamberlain to form an all-party government of national unity and supported rearmament for Britain and her allies to prepare for war with Germany. Although he had previously believed that Britain had no need for a continental army and could support its allies with its navy and air force, Halifax now believed that France could not be expected to shoulder the burden of fighting on land and supported high-level Anglo-French military talks to determine the level of military support Britain should provide. Having rejected appeasement, Halifax now believed that Britain and her allies should strengthen their military capacity to deter Hitler from war. His demands for defence spending were rejected by John Simon, now Chancellor of the Exchequer, who was afraid that increased spending would cause inflation and risk an economic collapse as bad as the crisis of 1931. While he hoped that Italy might be persuaded to restrain Germany, a visit to Rome with Chamberlain in January 1938 convinced Halifax that the German-Italian axis was too strong. By the spring of 1939, owing to the gulf that had opened up between Chamberlain and Halifax, the Foreign Secretary was being actively considered among the increasing number of anti-appeasers in the Conservative Party as an alternative Prime Minister, and Halifax was regularly seen in the company of Churchill, Eden, and senior Labour politicians. On the 15th of March, Hitler invaded and occupied the rest of Czechoslovakia without facing any resistance. Not only did the invasion violate the Munich Agreement, but Halifax told the cabinet that it demonstrated that Hitler's ambitions went beyond the reintegration of German-speaking peoples. Determined to show Hitler that Britain would not tolerate further aggression, Halifax argued that Britain should make security guarantees to Poland and Romania and force Hitler to fight a war on two fronts. A reluctant Chamberlain was persuaded by these arguments, and on the 31st of March, 
the Prime Minister told the House of Commons that Britain was bound to come to Poland's assistance in the event of a German invasion. A couple of weeks later, on the 13th of April, Chamberlain agreed to Anglo-French guarantees for Greece and Romania. Although he hoped that security guarantees would deter Hitler, Halifax continued to call for the government to step up military preparations, and on the 27th of April, conscription was introduced for 20 and 21-year-olds. Meanwhile, Halifax managed to persuade Chamberlain to open negotiations for an alliance with the Soviets, which began in May and lasted throughout the summer. The Foreign Secretary knew that Poland and Romania were as fearful of the Soviets as they were of Germany, but kept the talks alive, fearing that the Nazis and Soviets might come to an agreement instead. Disagreements about the terms and the extent of an Anglo-French-Soviet alliance caused the talks to break down on the 21st of August, and on the 23rd, Halifax's fears came true when Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov and his German counterpart Joachim von Ribbentrop signed a non-aggression pact. For the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, it was an easy decision, as not only was he secure from German aggression, he had been offered the eastern third of Poland and the three Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. Despite the expectation that the Polish resistance would be short-lived, Halifax signed the Anglo-Polish Agreement on the 25th of August as a sign of Britain's determination to stand by Poland. He hoped that the show of defiance would force Hitler to back down and welcomed Italian proposals for a general peace conference. But before one could take place, Germany invaded Poland on the 1st of September. Rather than declaring war right away, which would have risked German bombs falling on London before Britain had time to prepare, Halifax was keen in coordinating a response with France. On the 2nd, the British and French continued to hold out hope for a conference, but MPs in the House of Commons called for Britain to meet its obligations to its Polish ally immediately. By the end of the day, Halifax recognized that the Italians were in no position to persuade the Germans to stop the invasion, and at 11 o'clock on the 3rd of September, Britain declared war on Germany. Although Britain had gone to war pledging to defend Poland, Halifax recognized there was little Britain and France could do to prevent their ally from being overrun especially when the Soviets invaded two weeks later to claim the eastern portion. The French were not prepared to fight an offensive war. Bombing Germany would merely invite retaliatory attacks, which would undermine British rearmament, and intervention of any sort would antagonize the Soviet Union. Hitler knew this and hoped that he could subdue Poland rapidly and force Britain and France to agree to a peace that allowed him to keep his conquests. After a month of heroic Polish resistance, Hitler offered a peace on such terms in early October. But on the 12th of October, Chamberlain rejected the proposals outright, even though there were few in Britain who could envisage how the war could be won. Although Halifax's diplomacy in 1939 ensured that for the time being Germany was the only enemy and inherently hostile countries such as Spain, Italy and Japan remained neutral, Britain and France were alone, and Halifax's desired two-front war failed to materialize. While Halifax held out hope that Hitler might be removed from power and that an honorable peace could be negotiated with his second-in-command, Hermann Goering, he entertained peace initiatives as a way to win time to further strengthen Britain's military capabilities. On the day the war began, Chamberlain bowed to public pressure and appointed Churchill to his war cabinet as First Lord of the Admiralty, the minister responsible for the Royal Navy. From the outbreak of war in September 1939 until May 1940, the British Navy was the only branch of the armed forces capable of confronting the Germans, and its early successes enhanced Churchill's reputation in the country. Although before the war Halifax's turn against appeasement brought him closer to Churchill, once the war started, the First Lord criticized the Foreign Secretary's unwillingness to support more active military operations. After the Soviet invasion of Finland in November 1939, Churchill suggested sending troops to reinforce Finland via Sweden and Norway, a move Halifax rejected, 
since it would violate Swedish and Norwegian neutrality. But when Hitler invaded Denmark and Norway on the 9th of April 1940, Halifax approved plans to mine the Norwegian port of Narvik in order to prevent the port from being used to ship iron ore to Germany. The Narvik operation proved unsuccessful and British forces began to evacuate on the 2nd of May after failing to prevent the German conquest of Norway. When the House of Commons debated the fallout from the failed Norwegian expedition on the 7th of May, Chamberlain was surprised to hear stinging criticism from his own conservative benches. The prominent anti-appeaser Leo Amery channeled Oliver Cromwell by telling the Prime Minister, you have sat here too long for any good you have been doing. Depart, I say, and let us have done with you. In the name of God, go. On the following day, as First Lord of the Admiralty and the Minister directly responsible for the operation, Churchill stood up to defend the government's record. But his performance was half-hearted and failed to persuade the Tory rebels. Although Chamberlain won the vote, 281 to 200, almost 100 Conservative MPs abstained or voted against the government. Although a Prime Minister could survive such a setback in peacetime, the Prime Minister saw that Labour and the Liberals must be invited to join a national government immediately and recognised that Labour MPs would refuse to serve under him. As for who might replace Chamberlain, Halifax and Churchill were the only two viable candidates. But the Prime Minister told his Foreign Secretary that he was his preferred successor should he choose to resign. Having served as Viceroy of India and been the right-hand man of both Baldwin and Chamberlain, Halifax was more qualified than anyone else to do the job. Furthermore, not only was he the preferred candidate of most of the Conservative Party and the Labour leadership, he was also favoured by the King and Queen, who were personal friends of the Halifaxes and viewed Churchill with suspicion. When he was sounded out by Chamberlain on the morning of the 9th of May, Halifax argued that it would be difficult to conduct parliamentary business from the House of Lords, since the House of Commons was the main political arena. And while Halifax would bear responsibility as Prime Minister, he would not be able to defend his record in the Commons. That afternoon, Chamberlain and his chief whip, David Margeson, invited Halifax and Churchill to a meeting in the Cabinet Room to decide which one of them should become Prime Minister. Halifax repeated his view that he could not control the Commons from the Lords, and that he would be left as an honorary Prime Minister, while Churchill ran the show in the Commons. The Foreign Secretary added that while he had little experience of defence policy, Churchill was more qualified as a war leader. Chamberlain reluctantly agreed with Halifax's analysis, and Churchill hardly needed to say a word before it was agreed that he would become the next Prime Minister. Halifax's motives in declining the Premiership have been a source of debate among historians ever since. Despite his claims about the difficulties of leading the country from the Lords, the British Constitution was flexible enough to solve the problem. Halifax could have been allowed to speak, but not vote in the House of Commons, and the King was prepared to allow Halifax to temporarily step down as a member of the House of Lords, after which the Conservative Party could engineer a safe seat in the House of Commons for him. While he used this as justification for refusing the Premiership, Halifax's membership of the Lords could not be his fundamental reason for doing so. In addition to a genuine belief that Churchill was more suited to the role as a wartime leader due to his interest in military affairs, it is possible that Halifax also believed that he could more effectively control the dynamic but often erratic Churchill from the Foreign Office. He would continue to be the second most powerful man in government and remained the natural successor to the Premiership in the event that Churchill mishandled the war effort. On the morning of the 10th of May, Hitler invaded Belgium and the Netherlands in order to outflank the formidable French defences of the Maginot Line. Despite Chamberlain's attempts to hold on to the Premiership based on these new developments, by the evening Churchill was the new Prime Minister and invited Labour leader Clement Attlee and his deputy, Arthur Greenwood, into his five-member war cabinet. Churchill's position was precarious since Chamberlain was popular within the party and remained its leader. And as Lord President of the Council, the former Prime Minister continued to sit on the War Cabinet. 
Meanwhile, the German war machine cut through the French defenses, and desperate French counterattacks in the south were easily parried. The British expeditionary force had been sent across the channel to support France, but by late May, the British military leadership began to contemplate the surrender of France and the evacuation of the British expeditionary force. Faced with the prospect of standing alone against what appeared to be an invincible German war machine, Halifax returned to the idea of an Italian peace conference, hoping to save as much of France and the British expeditionary force as possible, even at the cost of surrendering several colonial possessions. While Churchill allowed Halifax to make an approach to the Italians in private, the Prime Minister and his Foreign Secretary were at odds over when and how to make the approach. Halifax believed that it was best to do so while the French were still in the war and the British Expeditionary Force was active in the field. But Churchill thought that Hitler could not be persuaded to talk peace until he tried and failed to invade the United Kingdom. Although Halifax suggested that any Italian brokered terms could be rejected if they threatened British sovereignty, Churchill knew that any approach to the Italians would damage morale if made public. During tense discussions in the War Cabinet between the 25th and 28th of May, while the Royal Navy was desperately evacuating more than 300,000 British and Allied troops from the port of Dunkirk, Halifax favoured making an immediate approach while Churchill suggested waiting for a few months. On the evening of the 28th, Churchill opened up the discussion to the full cabinet of 25, portraying the debate as one between resistance and surrender. After reconvening the war cabinet, the prime minister referred to the enthusiastic show of support he had just received, and Halifax was forced to back down. Churchill's position was soon vindicated when on the 10th of June, with France already on its last legs, Mussolini declared war. While Churchill was in favour of granting desperate French pleas to send more British fighters across the Channel, Halifax and the military commanders realised that the Royal Air Force had to be preserved for the imminent showdown with the German Luftwaffe over the skies of Britain. On the 13th of June, Halifax and Churchill went to France, where the Prime Minister urged his French counterpart, Paul Reynaud, to continue fighting. But on the 17th, France collapsed, and the First World War hero, Marshal Philippe Pétain, took Reynaud's place. Later that day, Rab Butler, Halifax's undersecretary at the Foreign Office, told the Swedish ambassador in an informal meeting that Halifax believed that common sense and not bravado should dictate our policy, and that in the event of a peace conference, Halifax might replace Churchill as Prime Minister. The conversation was reported to Stockholm and interpreted as a sign that despite Churchill's tenacity, Britain's willingness to fight on was not absolute. The phrase attributed to Halifax has contributed to his reputation of being a defeatist, though Halifax's biographer, Andrew Roberts, suggests that Butler was sharing his own views on the matter while claiming to speak with the Foreign Secretary's authority. The armistice Pétain signed with Germany and Italy on the 22nd of June officially recognized French independence, but with half the country under German occupation and Pétain forced to move his capital to Vichy in the south, France was effectively a German client state. Churchill was afraid that Hitler would now use France's remaining military resources against Britain, in particular the French Mediterranean fleet stationed in North Africa. After Anglo-French negotiations for a bloodless solution failed, on the 27th of June, the War Cabinet decided in favour of sinking the fleet. And on the 3rd of July, a British attack on the naval base at Mers el Kabir destroyed part of the fleet at the cost of more than 1,200 French lives. Although he recognised the moral dilemma of attacking a recent ally, Halifax supported the controversial operation in the interests of national security. During the summer of 1940, Halifax and his colleagues, who had served the Chamberlain government, came under attack from the Labour Party and the press, who urged Churchill to dismiss them from the government. The Prime Minister refused, knowing that most of the Conservative MPs remained sympathetic to Chamberlain and Halifax. Churchill was a creative thinker, who was prone to proposing wild and unrealistic plans, which, if pursued, 
would have risked lives and precious military resources, and Halifax saw it as his role to limit the Prime Minister to the more practical and achievable ideas. The Foreign Secretary maintained his policy of trying to ensure that Britain had as few enemies and as many friends as possible. In order to avoid antagonizing the Soviets, he refrained from condemning the invasions of Poland and Finland and sent the left-wing Labour MP Sir Stafford Cripps to Moscow as ambassador. He also played an instrumental role in strengthening Anglo-American relations and obtaining military assistance from the United States. During the summer of 1940, President Roosevelt was seeking an unprecedented third term at the November election and had no desire to commit to a costly war in Europe. Nevertheless, the Foreign Office warned Roosevelt that US national security would be at risk should the Royal Navy fall into German hands. During the long and tortured negotiations over exchanging American destroyers for British naval bases, Churchill ran out of patience with Roosevelt and drafted angry telegrams which Halifax ensured remained unsent. A deal was finally signed on the 2nd of September, whereby Britain would receive 50 destroyers and the United States was granted 99-year leases on British air and naval bases in North America and the West Indies. Although most of the American destroyers were too old, the deal improved morale in Britain and paved the way for further American assistance. During the autumn of 1940, Halifax was preoccupied with the question of France. Following the collapse of France, General Charles de Gaulle fled to London and established Free France, a government in exile in opposition to Pétain's Vichy regime. In September, a joint effort by British and Free French forces to liberate the Senegalese capital of Dakar was soundly defeated by Vichy forces. The setback prompted Halifax to pursue a new policy intended to avoid outright war with Vichy and encourage anti-German feeling among the French colonies while keeping de Gaulle on side. With Churchill's consent, Halifax was allowed to engage in talks with Vichy to come to a mutually beneficial arrangement. Although it was officially denied by the British after the war, on the 25th of October, Churchill and Halifax agreed with the Vichy envoy Louis Rougier that French colonies which remained loyal to Vichy and those which sided with de Gaulle would not attack each other. Additionally, in return for resisting German demands, Britain agreed to halt anti pétain propaganda and ease the economic blockade it had imposed on the French colonies. By late 1940, Halifax was convinced that Britain was secure from invasion as the Royal Air Force prevented the Luftwaffe from gaining the air superiority required for an invasion fleet to cross the Channel. While Churchill proposed taking the war to Germany and bombing Berlin, Halifax suggested sending reinforcements to the Mediterranean where the Italians were besieging Malta and were attacking Libya and Egypt. During debates in the War Cabinet, the Foreign Secretary wondered if German preparations for an invasion of England were merely intended to divert British forces away from a major German push into the Mediterranean, and on the 3rd of October, suggested reinforcing Malta and the Middle East. When Italy invaded Greece on the 28th of October, Halifax persuaded Churchill to send four air squadrons to Greece on the 2nd of November. The Greeks were not only able to mount a successful defence, but launched a successful counter-offensive during the winter that forced the Italians back to Albania. At the end of September, six weeks before his death, Chamberlain resigned from the War Cabinet due to ill health, and on the 8th of October, Churchill offered Halifax the opportunity to return to the posts of Lord President of the Council and Leader of the House of Lords. But despite the Prime Minister's claim that this would make him second in command, Halifax refused. With Chamberlain's departure, Halifax was the sole restraining influence on Churchill in the War Cabinet and exercised this role more effectively from the Foreign Office. Despite their differences, Halifax began to admire Churchill's genius even if he had to check the Prime Minister's impulsive tendencies. This arrangement was disrupted with the unexpected death of the Marquis of Lothian, the British ambassador to the United States, on the 12th of December. 
Churchill had a tendency to move troublesome politicians into ambassadorships and offered the role to the 77-year-old Lloyd George. When the former Prime Minister declined, Churchill offered the post to Halifax. The Prime Minister did not appreciate having his freedom of action limited by his Foreign Secretary, and with Chamberlain no longer on the scene, he felt confident enough to send Halifax away. Halifax violently resisted the appointment, as not only would it spell the end of his political career in England, he and Lady Halifax would be torn from their aristocratic lifestyle as personal friends of the King and Queen to move to a country which instinctively disliked nobility. The protests were to no avail, as Churchill had made up his mind. And on the 23rd of December, Halifax accepted the posting to Washington, while the vacancy at the Foreign Office was filled by Anthony Eden. Although Halifax was given an unprecedented welcome by President Roosevelt, who sailed out in his presidential yacht to greet the new ambassador, he soon proved ill-suited to the job. He never understood the American mentality or its system of government, and presented the image of an out-of-touch British aristocrat trying to influence American politics. Prompted by his wife and his cousin, Angus MacDonald, who had worked in the Virginia railway industry 30 years earlier, Halifax began to act more informally, and by the summer of 1941, the American public was more sympathetic to him. Once the United States entered the war in December 1941, after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the Halifaxes gained widespread popularity. As the Anglo-American relationship strengthened, the British diplomatic establishment in Washington grew to over 9,000 people, including the philosopher Isaiah Berlin and the economist John Maynard Keynes. While they were in Washington, the Halifaxes suffered personal tragedy when their second son, Peter, was killed at the Battle of El Alamein in November 1942. And a couple of months later, their youngest son, Richard, lost his legs in North Africa, resulting in an outpouring of public sympathy for the family. By 1944, the course of the war had shifted decisively in the Allies' favor, and thoughts turned towards the post-war global order. In January 1944, Halifax made a speech in Canada predicting that the United States, the Soviet Union, and China would emerge from the war as the three global superpowers. In order to maintain British prestige as the fourth power, he argued that Great Britain should retain close links with its colonies in the empire. The speech was poorly received by the Canadians, and Halifax was forced to apologize to the Canadian Prime Minister, William Mackenzie King. At the same time, Halifax resisted Churchill's prediction of an Iron Curtain dividing the world between the capitalist West and the communist East. During the war, Halifax was keen to increase aid to the Soviet Union and recognized the Soviet contribution to the victory over Hitler in the Second World War. His belief in cooperation rather than confrontation with the Soviets was motivated by a desire for greater global cooperation and he played an influential role in the Dumbarton Oaks Conference in 1944, which laid the foundations for the United Nations. In 1944, Churchill recognized Halifax's wartime efforts by making him the Earl of Halifax. In the general election of July 1945, in spite of his wartime success, Churchill was defeated by Labour's Clement Attlee. The new Prime Minister asked Halifax to stay on in Washington, where he worked alongside the economist John Maynard Keynes to negotiate a $3.75 billion loan to help Britain recover from the economic losses sustained during the war. After the loan was agreed in December 1945, Halifax was furious to hear that his fellow Conservatives had abstained and told a friend that he considered defecting to Labour. Despite his initial fears about the United States, Halifax enjoyed his five-year stint in Washington, and when he left his post on the 1st of May, he was showered with praise by statesmen and officials from both sides of the Atlantic. After returning to Britain, he refused Churchill's offer to serve in the shadow cabinet and retired from politics altogether. Unlike Churchill, he did not leave behind an extensive volume of memoirs about the war, and his 1957 autobiography, Fullness of Days, was little more than a collection of amusing anecdotes from his past. 
Although he had a lively correspondence with Churchill about appeasement, he did little to change his public perception in the 1950s as a champion of pre-war appeasement and a defeatist who wanted to make peace with Hitler while Churchill vowed to never surrender. As an elder statesman and prominent aristocrat, Halifax continued to be involved with a number of organizations after his retirement from politics. He continued to serve as Chancellor of Oxford University and also served as a governor of Eton College. In 1943, he was appointed Chancellor of the Order of the Garter, the highest ranking order of chivalry in Britain. And in 1957, he was also made Grand Master of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, despite not being a member himself. On the 23rd of December, 1959, Edward Wood, first Earl of Halifax, died at the age of 78. Edward Wood was born into a wealthy aristocratic family who had high ambitions for their sole surviving son. Although his 15 years as a Conservative MP were rather unremarkable, he played an instrumental role in the rebellion which toppled Lloyd George's coalition government in 1922. As Lord Irwin and later Lord Halifax, he became one of the most prominent statesmen in the country, and his rational and pragmatic approach to politics made him a household name after he secured peace in India during his term as Viceroy. Between 1935 and 1940, he was the right-hand man for three successive Conservative Prime Ministers. While he was one of the main champions of appeasement in the Baldwin and Chamberlain governments, it was a policy that remained popular in the country until Hitler's invasion of Czechoslovakia. Already after Munich, Halifax recognized that there could be no European peace with Hitler and became the leading anti-appeasement voice within Chamberlain's government. His diplomacy in 1939 and 1940 was motivated by a desire to keep Germany isolated as far as possible and to give British industry the time to rebuild military capacity, especially in the air. The motivations behind his decision to refuse the premiership in May 1940 remain the source of historical controversy, as does his openness to peace talks after the collapse of France. Nevertheless, as ambassador to the United States for much of the war, he helped to nurture a diplomatic relationship which enabled Britain to survive and emerge victorious from the war. What do you think of Lord Halifax? Does he deserve his reputation as a champion of appeasement who failed to recognize the militaristic nature of Hitler and Mussolini's fascist regimes? Or did Halifax's cautious approach, in fact, give Britain the necessary time to rearm so that the Royal Air Force was capable of defeating Hitler's plans to invade Britain in the autumn of 1940? Please let us know in the comments section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.